In case you're interested, Taylor Swift will be bringing back to America the Eras Tour later this month. And I checked the prices last week. And if you want to go, a ticket will only cost you $2,000. But if you ever... <laughs> I'm not saying it's not worth it. I'm just telling you some information. And so, have you ever, though, spent a lot of money on a concert that just didn't live up to the hype? If so, then you might be able to relate to the audience in Woodstock, New York at the Maverick Concert Hall on August 29th, 1952. Most of us are probably more familiar with the concerts that happened at Woodstock in 1969, but I promise that the concert at Maverick Hall in 1952 was just as provocative, and it's the perfect setup for our scripture passage this morning. The infamous piece played at this concert was the brainchild of an American composer and music theorist named John Cage. John Cage was born on September 5th, 1912 in Los Angeles. And early on, it was very evident that John was brilliant, introspective, and somewhat quirky. He composed music from a young age. He was a gifted student and writer. He graduated valedictorian of his high school. And he enjoyed long stretches of meditative silence. He spent his young adulthood wandering through Europe gaining an appreciation for painting and poetry, and especially music. Cage returned to America to study under the legendary composer Arnold Schoenberg, but Cage just couldn't color within the lines. His theory of music fell outside of the mainstream. He allowed freedom within his compositions for musicians to improvise. He wanted every performance of his music to sound different, he liked unpredictability and added an element of chance to his work. Plus, he believed that every object could emit music, so many of his compositions, including non-traditional instruments like duck calls and noise machines and transistor radios. And the musical elite mostly tolerated Cage's uh, peculiarities because he was just so talented. But a fine line separates genius from madness, and for most of his contemporaries, John Cage crossed over that boundary into madness with his most famous and audacious composition known simply as four minutes and 33 seconds. The concept for Cage's daring magnum opus came to him over the span of several years. Uh, for example, he was first introduced to Zen Buddhism in the 1940s. John Cage had always maintained the fondness for the Eastern philosophies as the notions of meditative contemplation, simplicity, and oneness with nature really spoke to him. But how could that translate into music? Then, in 1951, he visited the Anaconic Chamber at Harvard University. The Anaconic Chamber is basically a silent room. It's echo-proof, it's soundproof. So Cage went into the room expecting to experience absolute silence. Instead, he heard a faint hum. He asked the engineer in charge about that noise, and he was informed that it was simply his nervous system purring along. He had just never heard it because the noise of the world had constantly drowned it out. So he started to wonder, what other sounds was he missing in life? And finally, later that year, he visited a friend's art exhibit that absolutely mesmerized him. His friend had painted a canvas pure white. So appropriately, he titled it White Painting. And most of us would see nothing in a pure white painting. We would get bored, and rightfully so, but Cage was fascinated by how the white canvas was constantly changing according to what was happening around it. Light reflected off it differently depending on where you stood in the room. Shadows danced across it as people moved. Dust collected on it in different patterns. So the painting, to him, was new every time he looked at it. The void on the canvas was filled with its surroundings. So... With all that inspiration, John Cage was ready to write his most courageous piece of music yet. He called it Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, and it premiered on August 29, 1952, in the rustic Maverick Concert Hall in Woodstock, New York. The pianist, David Tudor, had the honor of first performing it. And that night, the tiny venue was packed with the most distinguished names in classical music. Silence fell on the crowd as the musicians sat down in front of the gorgeous Steinway piano. 
And then Tudor stretched out his arms, took a deep breath, and played absolutely nothing for an excruciating four minutes and 33 seconds. To say that the audience was disappointed was an understatement. They were angry at four minutes and 33, minute, uh, four minutes and 33 seconds of absolute silence. They thought Cage was mocking them. They thought he was thumbing his nose at the musical establishment. And granted, that would have been awesome. But according to Cage, they had missed the point entirely of his silent song. As he learned in the anaconic chamber, there's no such thing as absolute silence. And there is music all around us we just don't hear because of the noise of the world. Plus, as he had learned from the white painting, the environment always fills the empty void. During four minutes and 33 seconds, the audience was to listen to the ambient sounds all around them that they would normally be missing had they only listened to what they were supposed to hear. So Cage's composition would change every time it was quote-unquote played. And as Zen Buddhism taught him, Cage wanted his listeners to connect with nature. He forced them to listen to the rain that was tapping on the roof that night. He compelled them to listen to the crickets chirping outside. And he wanted them to use that time for silent meditation. After all, this was far different from ordinary silence. We expect silence in a place like a library, but a silent concert hall is unexpected and otherworldly and uncomfortable. And that's the whole point. Well, the music, musicians in attendance were having none of that. That wasn't music, they objected. And even Cage's own mother thought that he had finally gone too far this time. But all the way up to his death on August 12, 1992, John Cage insisted that four minutes and 33 seconds was not a mockery of modern music. It was a celebration of it. And sometimes, in the absence of sound, the most beautiful symphonies can be heard. Now, I've been known to scorn such outrageous cases of artistic overreach, in my opinion. I've been very open in our times together about my disdain for modern scribble art that takes no real talent. The modern art scene is just a bunch of rich snobs convincing each other how brilliant they are. But you know what? I'm tempted to give John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds the benefit of the doubt, because I kind of get it. First of all, all the musical elites were offended by it, so that automatically makes me like it. <laughs> but four minutes and 33 seconds also works because it wasn't written by some no-talent hack, like I couldn't get away with writing that. But John Cage was a legit composer. Cage had written some of the most beautiful and innovative music compositions of his time. So it's not like he couldn't have written a more conventional music piece. He just chose not to. Plus, he left a genuine impression on his audience. We're still talking about this piece 72 years later. How many other compositions have had that kind of staying power? And 4 minutes and 33 seconds has been performed by some of the biggest names in the music business, including Frank Zappa, the BBC Symphony Orchestra, and the Berlin Philharmonic. 4 minutes and 33 seconds is, without a doubt, John Cage's most controversial and influential contribution to American music, or perhaps anti-music. Now, as I tell this story, some of you have fallen in love with the concept of four minutes and 33 seconds. Some of you find it absolutely ridiculous. And I understand both sides, I really do. But no matter which side of the fence you fall on, you can't deny this. There is tremendous power in silence. Silence speaks volumes. Silence can't be ignored. And that's why some of us are kind of terrified of silence, right? You get that? You're terrified of maybe the thoughts and feelings that come to the surface to kind of fill that void that John Cage would make, right? Sometimes it's hard to be silent when there's trouble in your heart. And Jesus, who was the master of making people think, he performed the silent treatment to perfection in today's passage. And we're going to look at that. So I'm going to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. John 8, 2 through 11. It's going to be, you think that that concert would have been uncomfortable. Wait till Jesus uses silence. Don't worry, I'm not going to use that technique today. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to take out one of ours from the shelf underneath the pew in front of you. Turn to page 894 or scan the QR code in your bulletin. And that will take you to John 8, 2 through 11. John 8, 2 through 11. 
The smartest man in the room has all the right answers, but according to Jesus, the wisest man asks all the right questions. And so in the last few weeks, we have been studying the king's questions, all the good questions that Jesus asked his followers. And in today's passage, we see one of Jesus' most penetrating and thought-provoking questions of all. He asks, has no one condemned you? When it comes to religion, condemnation seems to be all we get. That's what the religious elite have been doing for centuries. That's how they control people. But Jesus was kind of the John Cage of religion. He wasn't afraid to use silence to challenge the establishment's preconceived notions. And sometimes the silent treatment is exactly what we need. So let's look at John chapter 8, starting at verse 2. It said, Early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. This is Jesus now. And so the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst... And they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? Hmm? And so they said this to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Well, neither do I condemn you. And from now on, sin no more. So Jesus was... Minding his own business as the religious elites burst into his lecture uninvited, and they dragged in this poor woman who had committed adultery. Now, I'm not sure how they committed her in the act, as the passage says. Were they waiting for her? Had she, maybe they'd set her up, and, and where was her partner in crime? This whole situation smells rotten, but I think we'd all agree that adultery is wrong. There's no question. It really hurts people. And if you were the victim of these people's adultery in this story, then you'd be angry and hurt and devastated. So no one defended her, and she didn't deny her sin, uh, that she was guilty. But do you get the impression that the Pharisees cared about any of this? Do you get the impression that they were in the business of easing people's pain? No, because they dealt in religion, not comfort. And the only way they stayed in business was to make sure that everyone stayed in line. So that meant a healthy dose of fear and shame and manipulation. It's good for business. But honestly, do you think they even cared about the sanctity of the religious law as laid out in the Torah? Don't you get the impression this is more about defeating Jesus than preserving the integrity of God's word? Of course it was. But just because the religious elite in this passage were jerks doesn't mean they were wrong about the law. So let's consider their challenge to Jesus. Does the law of Moses command that adulterers and adulteresses must be stoned to death? It absolutely does. Leviticus 20, verse 10, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The Pharisees were absolutely right in their interpretation of the law. There's no ambiguity, loopholes, or wiggle room. A plain, literal, responsible interpretation of this passage demands for this woman and her partner to be put to death. And the way the Jews did that was by stoning. Now, at another time, we can discuss why the Torah prescribed such a harsh punishment for adultery. But that's not the point of this story. So we're going to leave that right now. But the law leaves no doubt. The law doesn't care about feelings, nor does it have feelings. It does not operate on a case-by-case basis. It does not... Consider the circumstances or the damage that may be done by following the law. It's one size fits all. It makes no distinctions. So either you obey it or you break it. And guess what? Jesus broke it. 
I don't know how else you can interpret his actions from this passage. Unless there's some rule that I don't know about in the Old Testament that negates this law, Jesus did not do what the law clearly prescribed. Neither did the self-proclaimed guardians of the law, by the way. They had no intentions of stoning this woman. There hadn't been a confirmed stoning in Israel for centuries. So they weren't even following the law in the strictest sense. That's why this passage is just kind of dripping with hypocrisy. Not even the Pharisees were prepared to do what the law prescribed. So Jesus basically hit them with four minutes and 33 seconds of incredibly awkward silence, or however long he let them stand there. Jesus absolutely bludgeoned them with silence, actually. And to amplify the silence, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And I would love to know what he wrote on the ground, but I suppose there's no use speculating. If it were important towards the understanding of this passage, then John the author would have told us what he wrote. But the Pharisees weren't amused, and they couldn't stand the silence, so they kept badgering Jesus for an answer. But as usual, Jesus knew exactly what to say. He didn't tell them to break the law. He told them, go ahead and fulfill it, because he knew they weren't going to actually do it. He just took this opportunity to make a point at their expense. No one can fulfill the law perfectly. The only one without sin is the Son of God. The only one qualified to throw a stone in this passage was Jesus, but he didn't. Think about that. Jesus didn't condemn someone who was blatantly guilty of a very specific sin. So how could he allow for God, who wrote the law, who was so holy, how could he take on the responsibility? How could he allow someone not to follow the law? He died on the cross for our sins. He was resurrected three days later to prove it. So whoever simply trusts him, Jesus freely offers forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. Titus chapter 3 says this, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might be, become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Just trust Jesus, and he promises to save you. Stop following the law and start following him. Stop following rules and start walking in a new way. This is the Jesus life. So after Jesus flattened them with his perfect response, he allowed them to stew in the silence a little bit more, and eventually they couldn't take it. So the older ones knew that they had been beaten, and then the younger ones left too. And so it was just Jesus and this woman. And then Jesus asked her these questions. He says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And these questions seem a bit rhetorical. Sorry, I have my sound turned off, but... My phone decided to go crazy on me. And so he says, has no one condemned you? And, and these questions seem a bit rhetorical, but she answered them anyway. She said, no one, Lord. And then Jesus made this remarkable statement. He said, neither do I condemn you. And from now on, sin no more. And this is remarkable, folks. After this long, silent treatment, Jesus didn't condemn her. And that's our main point from today's passage. The main point is this. In your bulletin, if you'd like to write it down. The main point is condemnation wasn't part of his conversation. Condemnation wasn't part of his conversation. And this might surprise you, but the Apostle Paul couldn't have been clearer. Romans 8, verses 1 through 4, Paul said this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do 
by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he commended, con- condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so Jesus didn't follow the law in this situation. Jesus broke the rules to protect the woman. And it makes me wonder what other rules Jesus might break if the situation called for it. But it says in John three seventeen, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that he, the world might be saved through him. You see, Jesus was more concerned about preserving a person's well-being than he was about preserving the sanctity of the law. Jesus was more concerned about protecting a person's dignity than he was about protecting God's reputation. Because when we love people as Jesus did, we don't need the law. Paul said in Romans 13.10, Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. But we are so concerned about following the rules as evangelicals, aren't we? As generally in America, you'll hear a lot of stuff like this. You'll say, well, we we need to uphold the holiness of God. God doesn't let sin slide, so neither should we. Otherwise, God's reputation might suffer. Sin, after all, is an affront to God. And I don't disagree with those statements on their face. But you know what? Jesus didn't seem to worry too much about his reputation. God now lived among the prostitutes and tax collectors. God withheld condemnation for obvious sinners like in this passage. God dealt out grace and forgiveness liberally through the Son of God. And God didn't need to make an example out of anyone. He was okay with being known as a friend of sinners. So God's reputation is not ours to uphold. Instead, whenever sin is challenged, it should be done like Jesus did it in this passage in the best interest of the sinner, not out of some desire to protect God's reputation. If your conversation with someone about their sin is for any other motive than your concern for your fellow man, then maybe we should just keep it to ourselves. Notice that in this passage, both Jesus and the Pharisees acknowledged this woman's sin. Jesus wasn't blind to the injustices of this world. Jesus knew that somewhere in that town, someone was hurting Someone had been wronged by this woman's actions. Someone had been betrayed. Sin is real. Sin destroys. It's kind of like a ricocheting bullet that hurts people who aren't even involved in the situation. So when we help others out of it, their well-being and the well-being of those around them is always our top priority. Always. We do not confront or challenge sin out of our own sense of being offended. We do not confront or challenge sins out of a desire to defend God's honor. God's honor is intact, right? That's not even in the situation. That's not even in the equation. God can worry about his own reputation. Jesus was not concerned about his reputation. Nor do we need to make sure that God's integrity, character, and holiness is somehow preserved through our condemnation of sin. God doesn't need to prove to anyone that he's holy. He just is. His ego isn't fragile. And there are no rules really for a church to follow when someone stumbles into sin. In fact, the more we focus on rules, the more sin we produce, according to the Apostle Paul. Look what he says in Romans 7, 5. It's plain as day. He says, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for sin. That's what we get when we focus on the law. You see, the church, I don't believe, needs to prove to its members or to God or to the world that it's serious in its opposition to sin. In fact, when a church is loving people as Jesus did, then it will probably raise a few eyebrows among insiders and outsiders. But Jesus didn't care about that. He was okay being identified as a sinner and a drunkard and even a demon-possessed Samaritan one time. He was, in fact, none of those things. 
But he didn't care about people calling him that due to the lavish time and attention he spent on those kind of folks. So upholding God's reputation or a church's reputation has nothing to do how, with how we respond to folks who are struggling for sin, in sin. Oftentimes, churches will follow like a rule book when someone sins out of some misguided sense of duty. But the only thing that matters when someone stumbles is helping them get back on course. That's the focus. Because we don't want them to hurt themselves, and we don't want them to hurt someone else. Their well-being and the well-being around them is the, of the people around them is the first and only concern. So if our concern is something other than that, maybe we should mind our own business. And as such, two people may commit the very same sin, but maybe we handle it, the situations very differently. If love calls for reconciliation in one case, then we go for that. If maybe love calls for confession, then we go for that in another case. But if that's not what's best in some other situation, then we do something else. We just do what does the most good. We just, we, we kind of put the rules away and we just do what's right, whatever that is. Sometimes being right is being kind of hard. Sometimes what's right is being really soft. We just work on a case-by-case basis, whatever's in their best interests. Anything else is just kind of unnecessary. But listen, before we get too worked up with this stuff, we all sin. We all hurt people. We all have this destructive bent that needs to be tamed. So we better deal with our own destructive tendencies before we start dealing with someone else's, right? We learned that last week. So how do we deal with our sin? How do we avoid it? How do we help other people with their sin? Well, thankfully, Jesus was not silent on this. He gave the woman some simple advice. In fact, it's so simple that we're tempted to kind of treat it as a throwaway line before moving on to the next passage. But it's loaded with meaning, and it's very helpful. Jesus told her to go and sin no more. And that's our application from today's passage. The application is walk, don't sulk. Go, walk, go in your life and sin no more. You see, we underestimate the power of what Jesus said here because when someone stumbles in American church today, we tend to do the opposite of what Jesus said. We focus on the, we'll sin no more part. We want them to sulk and brood and stew in their shame for a while. And when I say we, I mean in general. I don't mean you or me. But in general, in the church in America. And then, only after we've thoroughly beaten that dead horse, well, then the, the person's allowed to go. That way, we'll show God and everyone else how serious we are. There's only one problem with this approach. The person always goes right back to what they were doing before. Once the shame wears off, they fall back into sin. And the only thing our discipline has accomplished is humiliating them. Now, you might not believe me on this, but folks, I've been in full-time ministry for a long time. I've seen a lot of stuff. I know a lot of things about people. And very few people are actually overcoming sin. That's, that's the bottom line. Very few people are. The techniques that we've used as a church uh, in America over the last 50, 60, 70 years, they're not working. And so what do we do? Well, the American church has decided we're going to come down on them even harder. And we preach even more harshly than before, and we ratchet up the shame and guilt and fear and manipulation, hoping that doing something harder that hasn't been working will make it work. But listen, if what we're doing isn't working, why are we still doing it? Is the church becoming more holy through our sin-focused preaching? Look around at the American church. Do American churches look like a healthy bunch of saints to you? Sulking over sin and meticulously picking at our scabs is getting us nowhere. There may be an appearance of holiness, but we're just driving everyone's sin deeper underground. Folks, trust me on that. 
That's what I've seen in my 20-some years of ministry. But Jesus' ministry wasn't intensive on, like, sin recognition. Surely, we start with sin when we share the gospel. Absolutely. But when trying to live out the Jesus life, the focus cannot be on sin management. It just can't. Because that's not where Jesus started. He didn't sit down with this woman to make sure, sure she knew how serious her sin was. That was pretty obvious, right? And so he didn't have endless counseling sessions with her. She wasn't put in a penalty box for some prescribed amount of time. The sin no more part didn't come first. It's a subtle difference, but I think it's a real difference. Instead, first and foremost, she was told to go. She was told to go about her Christian walk and work on her soul along the way. See, as we live out the Jesus life and the Jesus philosophy, our lives will naturally adjust away from sin as we work on all these heart issues that we talk about all the time. Our heart will naturally adjust away from sin. The more we focus on kind of loving people and and living simply and focusing on the present and doing all these things we're always talking about, the less we will sin. But guess what you get when you focus too much on sin and death? Guess what you get? You get more sin and death. That's just the practical working out. I've seen it all my life. And I'm not going to keep doing something that isn't working. Let me tell you a story about a beautiful Spanish princess named Isabel of Parma. Isabel was born on December 31st, 1741. And at the age of 18, Isabel was married to Archduke Joseph of Austria. Despite it being a marriage of political convenience, Joseph was deeply in love with Isabel. Isabel was beautiful, intelligent, talented, and the archduke doted on her. And so Isabel had everything going for her in life. But while Joseph was in love with Isabel, Isabel was in love with death. In fact, she was morbidly obsessed with death. Her mother had died tragically when Isabel was just a child, and ever since then, death was all she ever thought about. We know this because Isabel was a prolific writer and she buried her soul in her letters to her sister-in-law, Maria. Isabel wrote to her about how she was certain that she would die young. She wrote about her obsession with death in religious terms. She had heard a voice telling her that she was going to die. So Isabel was terrified of getting pregnant because she was sure she was going to die in childbirth, which wasn't an unreasonable fear back then. But when her first child actually died in childbirth... Her obsession got even worse. But instead of fighting death, she decided just to embrace it, and she prayed that she would die. Perhaps she suffered from what today we would call depression. Perhaps she was bipolar, people speculate. But sure enough, on November 27, 1963, Isabella Parma died at the age of 21. Not suicide. She just died. So you get what you focus on. You get what you focus on. And if the focus of our Christian life is sin prevention, and I'm all for sin prevention, but if the focus of your Christian life is sin prevention, guess what you'll get more of? You'll get more sin. That's why I don't spend every Sunday morning up here ranting and raving about sin. It's not that sin is is unimportant, or it's not that sin, we shouldn't do it, or it's not that sin, it, it is an affront to God. It's all those things. We've talked about sin this morning because Jesus talked about it. But we don't focus on not doing wrong. It's putting the the cart before the horse. We focus not on just doing right, but having this level of Jesus consciousness on the inside where kindness and love become our second nature rather than what it usually is with people where sin and death is there second nature because you get more of what you dwell on listen to what the apostle Paul said in Romans 8 walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh look what it says for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is 
is life and peace. Now, let me be clear. If someone is abusive, then we deal with it severely. If someone is in danger due to sin, then we handle it swiftly. Again, every case is treated different. If someone is struggling with addiction or substance abuse, then we promote long-term focused methods to deal with it. But for other things, we show grace and we show a lot of it. We show patience. We give people as long as they need to work through their sin. We give them time. Now, if it's destructive, like really, really destructive, acutely, then we deal with it immediately. But other cases, we just give people time to work through it. We allow the spirit of Jesus room to work in their hearts. It's okay if their lifestyle isn't quite where it should be yet. We give them time because neither is ours, really. So instead of zeroing in on all the things people are doing wrong, we talk about it, but instead of focusing on it all the time, we work on the underlying philosophy of how to not just do right, but how to have this right Jesus living consciousness in us. In other words, we work on the go. We work on the Jesus life and the philosophy before we work on the sin no more. Give people the opportunity to go and then work on the sin no more. We encourage more walking in the Christian life and less sulking over sin. We encourage, uh, uh, and, and sometimes that means we remain silent. Condemnation was not part of Jesus' conversation. It just wasn't. But sometimes, that, and, but sometimes love requires confrontation. Absolutely. Sometimes it does. But whatever is in the person's best interest and the interest of the people around them, that's what we do as a church and you as individuals. That's what we're asking you to do. No matter what the treatment, the focus is on life, not death. Focus is on doing good rather than not doing bad. So don't stop living just because you stumble. Don't quit in the Jesus life just because you're struggling with sin. Go and then sin no more. So Jesus, he would not let the religious establishment bother this poor woman any longer. And, and I know that this passage kind of turns, us up, turns our religion upside down sometimes, but that's okay. We're not afraid of that here. But the religious establishment, you have to understand, they never quit, ever. And the very institution that was meant to bring people comfort was actually making people's lives more difficult. But Jesus wasn't about that. And so in Mark, I'm going to encourage you to read Mark 14, 3 through 9 this week. And you bring a friend next Sunday as we explore a simple but profound question from Jesus. Why do you trouble them? Why do you trouble them? Why do we trouble people? The answer may surprise you. So come back next week. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for this message. And this passage is so profound that I know it turns most religious thinking upside down completely. And, and, but we can't be afraid of that, Lord. We're not afraid of that. We just want to walk with you and, and do the things you did and teach the things you taught. And, and so, Lord, I pray that for the folks here, they wouldn't focus so much on what they're doing wrong. We all recognize it. We all know it. But we just focus more on going and walking than sulking. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't rant and rave and, and, Lord, even in a well-intentioned way of upholding your reputation that we end up hurting people, I don't think that's what you've called us to do. So I pray we'd let you, you take care of your own reputation, and we'll just, we'll just try to do what Jesus did. Thank you, God, for these things and these truths, and I pray we live them out this week. In Jesus' name, amen.